Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Thank God for this opportunity that he has granted unto us to gather again for another uh, time of study in the word of God. His word is so precious. And as we are living in closing hours of time, the word of God becomes more essential than ever before. It is so important that we be rooted and grounded in the truth because there are so many false teachings and doctrines that's being propagated in these last times until if you don't know the truth, thank God for those old warriors that labored with us in the word, that put the word in us, that laid a solid foundation, that gave us some standards for godly and holy living. We celebrate the memory of all of those who sold into our lives during that season. And so now is our time to be able to leave a legacy for this current generation and the generation that is yet to come. Amen, that God is real, that his word is viable in the midst of this current culture. It doesn't matter what the culture is like. The word of God is appropriate and applicable to every culture. It's been that way since the word of God has been written. And we praise God, we honor our pastor tonight in his absence. And to each of you, my brothers and sisters that are here on the line, we thank God for you. Let us share a word of prayer and go right into our teaching lesson for tonight. Wow. Most gracious and everlasting Father, we approach your presence tonight saying thank you for extending to us the opportunity to come boldly in your presence. We come, God, with hearts of uh, gratitude and hearts of humbleness to say, God, we recognize that we don't deserve the favor and the blessings that you've granted unto us. No good thing that we've done, but it's been by your mercy and by your grace. And we say thank you for every blessing that you've given unto us. We pray now, God, as we prepare now to go into the word of the Lord on tonight, that you will speak in Jesus' name. Oh, God, sharpen our ears that we might hear what the Spirit is saying to us so that we can live better lives. Lord God, everyday lives in this common world, that we will know how to get along with our fellow men, not because they are saved, but just because they are fellow humans, God, that we can treat them right from your perspective and treat them with dignity and respect in Jesus' name, even though oftentimes we may not get it reciprocated, God, we still must do what we are supposed to do. So God, we pray that you will be satisfied and be glorified with what we run down to you tonight. We bless you and we praise you and give you glory in Jesus' name, amen. Once again, we thank God for Dr. Coward, amen. And I have not seen you all since convocation. Praise God, we, convocation was, was, was an awesome move of God during the convocation and we praise God for what he did in the midst of the people and among the saints. It was just so good to see so many people that we have not seen because of the current things going on in our world. It was good to see everybody. So we bless God for that on tonight. We concluded the last time I was with you, we concluded uh, Proverbs chapter 12. So our next time of study would be Proverbs chapter 13, which is where we're going tonight. And then I was away, I think one or two sessions um, 43rd wedding anniversary and something else that we were we didn't have a session the week of convocation on that Thursday night uh, so we thank God for being able to come together again so Proverbs chapter 13 reading both the uh, King James Version and the New Living Translation here we go chapter 13 verse 1 the King James a wise son heareth his father's instruction but a scorner heareth not rebuke. I love the Proverbs because they give us hardcore golden nuggets, as I've heard Pastor Kyle will say so many times, Bishop Kyle will say so many times, for everyday living. Amen. So these Proverbs apply to the saved as well as the unsaved. It's better for those of us who are saved because we have the aid of the Holy Ghost to help us to apply these principles, to apply these virtues and these vices, because the Proverbs mainly is a comparison between good and evil, right and wrong, in or out. So it's, it's that kind of comparison. And so the New, the New Living Translation, verse number one reads, a wise child accepts a parent's discipline. A mocker refuses to listen to correction. And in raising children, sometimes children that are born in the same family, same parents, don't have the same temperament. 
And some children do appreciate correction. They do appreciate the love and the accountability that parents give to their children. They, they appreciate it because they want to make something out of their lives. But then there may be a son or a daughter or two sons and a daughter, whatever. Someone in the family may not may, may be just rebellious as they can be, just as defiant as they can be. You say red, they say blue. You say right, they say no. You say yes, they say I'll think about it. Just, just contrary, just contrary, amen. But the Bible says a wise child. And the King James said a wise son. But we're speaking both male and female. You all heard me say that before. A wise child accepts a parent's discipline because there are times where children must be disciplined. I know there are a lot of people who don't believe in disciplining their children. They believe in the timeout system. They believe in taking things away from children. Uh, that, that, that may work on some level, but there are are times where that child needs the rod of correction. The Bible says so. The Bible encourages it. We're not talking about child abuse. We're talking about administering love and correction in love so that in the future, that child will have a good chance in the world. If you don't correct the wrong behavior while they are young and you let them grow up, with that thing and they think you think that behavior is cute and you think that behavior is uh, 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 oh that's so funny it's not funny when a child slaps his parent it's not funny when a child kicks his mother or his father it's not funny when a child curses his mother or father out if they do it and you let them get away with it at one and a half and two and three when they turn 15 because you didn't correct them in their minds they think that that is acceptable and appropriate. And now you're trying to get all bad and want to punch them in the chest. Now you're becoming abusive. Whereas had we done it when they were younger, while that tree was tender and we had administered that correction then and checked that behavior, then they wouldn't be in the pattern where they are. And I know there are some children that grew up in, in godly homes. We have prayer in the homes. We took our children to church, to Sunday school. They sat with us and sometimes they grow up and they still go astray. But if you've done what the word has encouraged you to do, you need not worry about that. The Bible says when they are old, they will not depart. So that word that was put down in them, they can't get away from that word. They try to, they try to drown it out through drugs, drown it out through alcohol, drown it out through men or women and illicit affairs. But that word, of God is planted in their DNA. And that word convicts them, even if they go beyond that conviction, that word still works because that's what God said that it would do, all right? But a mocker refuses to listen to correction. I haven't even gotten out of verse one yet. There are some that just won't listen to correction, no matter how you sit down and talk to that child and warn that child that that company is not good, that person that they're hanging with that they think is their best friend does not like them, that's trying to set them up, that they're jealous of them. Some children can't see it. They can't see it. They want to be accepted so bad and they're not looking for validation from the parent. They want the validation from their peers. And oftentimes when children get a certain age, what their friends think about and what their friends say on certain matters weighs more heavily for them than the remarks of their parent. And so we have to be prepared for that and keep our children covered in prayer. Verse two from the King James, a man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the transgressors shall eat violence. Wise words will win you a good meal, but treacherous people have an appetite for violence. Wise words. You know, and, and, and it's just, it's so important that we rear our children according to the word. Rear them in the wisdom and the teachings and the knowledge of God. Our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephew, wherever we can affect them with the word, let's do that. So that as they mature and become adults, 
their wise words will win them a good meal. I look at that also in terms of wise words from an individual will bring forth favor. Doors and opportunities will present themselves for you because you are a wise young man or a wise young woman. Let's look at the story of Joseph, my God. Let's look at David, how these were wise young men, my God, my, and how they were able to, Joseph at the age of 17 was managing all of the money of his boss. His boss didn't even know what his worth was. He didn't even know how much money he had accumulated. Joseph at the age of 17 was handling the books for his boss, for his master, my God, because God gave him wisdom. He was young. Yes, there were many things he didn't understand about life itself, but he loved God. He had a heart toward Jehovah. He was obedient to his father and that opened up doors for him even when his brothers meant it for evil, God was with him. God was with David and gave David wisdom how to defeat Goliath. And as a result of that, David got promoted in the king, in the kingdom. Saul asked Jesse to let David move into the palace. God had a plan. So we don't know what God has in store for our offspring. So we want to rear them with wisdom, teach them how to speak a word at the proper time. Verse three says, he that keepeth his mouth, keepeth his life. Sometimes we just have to be quiet and just shut our mouths. And I know we want to speak. I know we want to defend ourselves. I know we want to handle the situation, but sometimes we are too caught up in our emotions and we will make a wrong move predicated upon our emotions Whereas if we allow wisdom to kick in, God will give us a response and not a reaction. So when we respond to the situation or to the crisis at hand, wisdom is applied and people are blessed and things are issues are resolved because you moved in wisdom. So he that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. Those who control their tongue will have a long life. Opening your mouth can ruin everything. Sometimes that's why people hire attorneys because they understand the legal ease. They understand the legal jargon. We don't know. And in our haste to say something that we feel would be in our defense, we can ruin everything because now the opposing team has a golden nugget to use against you and beat you down and make you look crazy in front of the jurors who have to render a decision. That's why you have legal representation so that attorney can speak in your behalf. A good attorney will do that, all right? So I, I like that verse. We wanna keep our mouths closed and allow the wisdom of God to be shared abroad from our lips. Verse four, the soul of a sluggard desireth and hath nothing but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat my god lazy people want much but get little but those who work hard will prosper all right and so thank god we don't have to work as hard today in many instances and when i say that back in the day uh, the vast majority of our black women were housekeepers. They were day workers. That was hard labor, polishing silver, dusting, washing windows, keeping the children, sometimes nursing the children. When we search our history, uh, the old slaves, uh, they nursed the uh, other, other folks' children. And by the time they got home, they had very little energy for their own families, for their own husband. Men worked hard out in the cotton fields and the tobacco fields. They worked hard and they were cheated out of their wages, my God. But they, were, they worked hard, but God blessed our people uniquely in that way. My, and many of them didn't know Jesus, a lot of them did, my God. It was their faith in God that kept them grounded, that kept them focused, that kept, they, they had a, a hope and a belief that a better day was going to come. But lazy people want a whole lot, but they get very little. Why? Because they're lazy and they don't do anything. 
They won't even put the food on the fork and lift the fork up to their mouth. And once they get it in their mouth, they're too lazy to chew. That's the epitome of laziness. And God does not want us to be like that. He wants us to be diligent. The diligent soul would be made fat. We will, we, will, we, we will be enlarged. There was a term they used years ago, you know, uh, about being fat, blowing up, being larger than what you already are. That's the will of God to increase us, to make us greater than what we are. And we want to do that. We don't want to be considered sluggers. We don't want to be labeled as lazy, a lazy saint, a lazy Christian. Won't pray. Won't read the word. Those that know the word of prayer, you pray for me. How about you pray with me? Because you need to be praying for yourself. But we have lazy people even in church. We have lazy folk in our family. We go to the family reunions. They show up late, pack up a plate, take it back to their vehicle, come back and get another plate, and leave early. Don't try and set up for the reunion. Don't help break down for the reunion. Won't bring nothing for the reunion. Just sluggers, just lazy. And every family has one or two or three or more in the family group. And, and sometimes you say, Lord, if I could just choose my relatives, these folk, right, these here right here, they wouldn't be a part of my family dynamics. Praise the name of the Lord. But even through that, there's something that we can gain. The Bible says, verse five, oh, I, I didn't read it. Uh, verse, yes, I did read verse four in the uh, New Living Translation. Verse five, a righteous man hateth lying but a wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. Verse five from the New Living Translation, the godly hate lies. The wicked cause shame and disgrace. The wicked causes shame and disgrace, but a righteous man, he hates lying. Even if he, he or she finds themselves having told a lie before they, before they could, before they caught themselves, they spoke real quick and, and, and got the facts mixed up. Either way, it was a mistake. Yes, it was a fake, but it was, it was an untrue statement. So it was a lie. But a righteous person feels convicted and they will repent. They will beg someone's pardon and say, you know what? Forgive me. I spoke too quick. That is not exactly how it happened. This is how it happened. They will go back and try and correct their mistakes. But a wicked person will hang in there with that lie and know it's wrong, and know it's a lie, and don't care who that lie hurts. They don't care uh, what damage and the fallout will come. That's a wicked person. And as saints of God, we don't want to be labeled as wicked. We don't want to join in with another man's sin. We don't want to join in with another group's lies and perpetuate a lie and come against innocent folk because these are our friends. No, no, we don't join in with that. We don't cover lies. We, we don't do that. We don't do that. We pray for those who are caught up in that situation, in that predicament, but we don't cover a lie. If we're asked the truth, we are obligated to reveal the truth or ask God to give us wisdom, how to answer a situation, uh, perhaps without selling somebody out. But I'm gonna tell you the truth. If it come down to a matter of me going to jail and you going to jail and you did the crime, I'm going to sing like a bird. I'm not going to jail for you. No, I'm not going to jail for my son, for my daughter. No, I love you dearly. I'll come and visit you. I'm not going to spend time for a crime that you committed. No, every old folks had a saying, every tub has to sit on his own bottom. So whatever you've done, whatever you sow, the word says you reap. That's the fallout, all right? Verse six says, righteousness keepeth him that is upright in the way, but wickedness overthroweth the sinner. Godliness guards the path of the blameless, but the evil are misled by sin. Let me read that again from the New Living Translation. Godliness, a godly attitude, a godly lifestyle, a godly behavior, guards the path of the blameless. That kind of attitude, that kind of lifestyle in the sight of God, he, he declares you as being blameless. We're not perfect, 
but he says, because of the attitude of your heart, I can call you blameless. Your intentions and your motives and your agendas are right in my sight. You're not desiring to pilfer or to steal or to lie, to advance your agenda, to get more money, to get a position. No, you, you are a person of integrity. So I call you blameless. Godliness guards the path of the blameless, but the evil are misled by sin. When you live by sin, what the Bible says, my God, if we, if we live by the works of our flesh, we will die. If we continue living by the works of our flesh, we will die. We will die spiritually and we will die eternally. We will be separated from God with a sinful lifestyle and do not repent. My God, I want to be labeled as a godly individual. I want to be considered as God, as the Bible says, godliness. That's what I want. Verse number seven, there is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. Some who are poor pretend to be rich. Others who are rich pretend to be poor. Just be who you are. Everybody in the household of faith will not be a multimillionaire. Everybody in the body of Christ will not be ultra rich. I don't care what teaching comes out and I do not advocate poverty, but Jesus himself said, the poor you will have with you always. There's always going to be some person or persons who are poor in this world. That's just how it has been arranged. All right. That's just that's just the fact of life. Now, I choose not to be, quote unquote, poor. So my confessions, I don't confess poverty. I don't confess brokenness. I don't confess just barely having enough to get by. No, I may not be living uh, in the lap of luxury. But God provides for our need. We, we can honestly say that. We are not poor. By some men's standards, in terms of their wealth, we would be considered poor. But we are blessed. We're not sleeping outside on the trees, under the viaducts, by the train track. We don't have mice and rats and bugs crawling over us at night and having to cover up the newspaper. God has blessed us. So there are people who have, they are rich, but they claim to be poor. They claim they cannot help those who are indigent and who don't have what they have. They claim they can't, they, I can't, I can't do nothing to help you. They're lying. And then there are those who are poor, who don't have, but who's faking it, who's pretending, who's up to their wazoo in debt, trying to impress other people, have a nice apartment or house, but no food. And you're struggling. You don't have furniture in the house. I mean, there are people that live like that. No furniture in the house. They have a big old beautiful house. No furniture. They're sleeping on the floor in the living room. Don't have a kitchen table, a dining room table. Maybe have one or two pots. No food in the cabinets of the refrigerator. They're just perpetrating a fraud. And God does not want us to be like that either. All right. Verse 8. The ransom of a man's life are his riches, but the poor heareth not rebuke. Verse 8 from the New Living Translation. The rich can pay a ransom for their lives, but the poor won't even get threatened. Most folk are not going to take a poor person and, and send out a notice saying, I've got your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, your grandchild, whatever, and uh, you have to pay $300,000. Not for a poor person. They're not going to do that because they know they're not going to get a dime. Because no, who's going to help the poor man? Who's going to who's going to go and post that kind of money to to buy back a poor person? But a rich person, a Kennedy, a Ford, a Dupont, folk like that. My God, 
uh, 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 the guy who's uh, over Facebook, uh, his name escapes me right now, but your people of that caliber, they will, you know, if someone kidnaps them, their state will be willing to put them ransom money up to buy them back because they're considered a person of notoriety or a person of nobility or a person of means. You poor, most folk are not going to go to bat to do that for you. Most folk, they're not going to put their house up to buy you back. They love you. They're going to send a prayer up for you. God, make a way. Rescue them and bring them back. I'm not putting my house up. I'm not going in debt. And I'm not going to clean out my little savings account to try and get them. No, I love them dearly. God knows I do. But I'm going to pray for them while, while you work it out. And we're going to leave it right there. All right. So thank God. The poor just, if God does not speak up for the poor and God does not open up avenues for the poor. And again, we are considered by that 1% in this world's population, we are considered poor. We think of ourselves as quote unquote middle class, but either you're ultra rich or you're poor. Two classes of people. That's that's just how the world is divided now. Either you're ultra rich, you're the haves, as Tyler Perry had to show, the have and the have nots. But I'm grateful for the grace of God that it, that that mediates for us in our favor. And what we lack, He provides for us. And so we are the blessed and the highly favored of the Lord. Verse number eight, the ransom have, the ransom of a man's life are his riches, but the poor heareth not rebuke. Did I read that? Oh, yes, I did. I'm sorry. Verse number nine, uh, the light of the righteous rejoiceth, but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. From the New Living Translation, the life of the godly is full of light and joy, but the light of the wicked will be snuffed out. The little light that the wicked has will be snuffed out. Why? Because of the motives of his heart, the agenda of his heart, the wickedness of his lifestyle. And when I say his, I'm speaking male and female, but the godly, those who are upright in heart, their life is full of light and full of joy. Even in the midst of not having the best, I've been in homes where people didn't have the best. They had meager, they had meager means, but they were so happy, and the family was so connected. They loved the Lord. They had peace. They had joy. They were fulfilled. Yes, they lacked the things, the material possessions. Uh, they didn't have a fancy couch. Didn't have a fancy whatever. But they were content with what they had. And they lived that life and were happy. Yes, we all would desire to have perhaps more than what we have, but that's it. That's a desire. It's not that we need to have more. We just desire more. But we can make it with the things we already have, what God has already provided for us. It is enough for us to make it to heaven. And we can be happy what we have in our homes right now we can be happy if we choose to be happy and we can be satisfied if we choose to be satisfied and not clamor for other things. And again, I'm not knocking that. I'm not saying that's, I'm not judging. There are things, other things that I would desire to have, but I don't, it's not, it's not a do or die situation for me. I can go to heaven with what I already have. I've got clothes, I've got shoes. I got a few coins in my pocket. My bills are paid. And you can say the same thing. God has prospered us and we are thankful. We are grateful. Verse number 10, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well, but with the well advised is wisdom. Read that again. Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well advised is wisdom wisdom with the well advised is wisdom pride leads to conflict those who take advice are wise it's a pride a prideful person and that's not a good pride either it's a prideful person that know they need help know they don't know the answer know they need instruction 
They need assistance and they're fake. They say, oh, I don't need anything. I'm good. I'm all right. Why? I don't want to be beholden to nobody. We need one another. We are here to help each other in times of need, to assist one another. That's why we're connected. But that selfish, foolish pride, that arrogant pride, I don't want nobody involved in my business. And so you suffer and you go through and you do without. Not because God willed it to be that way. God provided avenues of blessings for you. But you were too proud and too centered on yourself and too arrogant to receive the help that God raised up for you. Let's not be like that. All right. It's a wise person. I'll read it again. Pride leads to conflict. Those who take advice are wise. None of us know everything. As a leader of God's people, speaking into the lives of other people, I don't know everything. I don't claim to know everything. But what I do know how to do is go before God in prayer and seek the mind of God and ask God to give me wisdom and revelation and insight that I can assist those who ask me for guidance and counsel or whatever uh, they're dealing with. I need the wisdom of God. I can't do that on my own. So we can't rely on ourselves. No matter what our experience may be, we still cannot rely on ourselves because the experience that we went through may not be the experience God wants you to share with this person. So God wants to give you fresh revelation to share with this individual in this matter. And so we must con consider God and, and, and seek the counsel and the will and the purpose of God in every situation. Verse 11, wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. This is gonna be our last verse for tonight. Wealth from get rich quick schemes quickly appears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. So we don't want to be so quick to get a quick fix and a quick blessing because the word says wealth from get rich quick schemes quickly disappears. And we've heard and seen on television many people that have won the lotto or came into a large sum of money on game shows within a year, they are bankrupt. They've lost everything. I mean, they won, you know, $350,000 or they won the lotto for $1.5 million or some significant number. But because they didn't have wisdom, they didn't have counsel, they were motivated by the greed of their flesh, they just went spending everything, not making any investments, not blessing the poor, not sowing into ministry. I mean, if you're gonna win that kind of money, at least be a blessing to the house of God, all right? But a lot of them didn't do that. They only spent it on, on themselves or on their cronies or their buddies. And they went for a trip around the world and they bought five cars and, you know, and it, you know, a million dollars seemed like a lot of money, but with the inflation rate, a million dollars won't last a very, very, very long time. So you need to have some wisdom and some guidance in terms of what to do and how to manage, all right? So wealth from get rich quick schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. And one thing about the old school patriarchs, they taught us the value of work. Get up and go to work. Most times they didn't tell us nothing about owning your own business. So again, I say we don't have to work as hard uh, for other people now. We God have blessed us. We can go into our own business ventures and invest in our own sales, make our own schedules and yada, yada, yada. That's a good thing, all right? But they taught us the value of working, of being responsible, of laboring. They taught us that value and taught us, they, you know, save something. Don't spend every dime you get your hands on. Save something, the term they used back in the day when I was growing up, put something aside for a rainy day. A lot of them didn't trust the banking institutions, so they kept their money in cans and jars and hid it in the ground or hid it in the wall. Uh, but they believed in putting something aside. So when, when a, a crisis situation came up, they went to that stash 
and was able to help out in that immediate situation. And so as we conclude on tonight, we want to be wise servants of God, wise people of God, being governed by God's mandates and by God's rules and regulations so that what we gain and glean by our hands and our hard labor and our work ethic, that it will benefit us not just for the here, but also for the here and now, but for the later, that we'll have something that we can be a blessing to someone else, that even after we've left, we've left a good, a left a good working legacy in the earth that people can say about us, we were diligent in our working, we were faithful, we were committed, we could be trusted. Those are good things to leave in the earth that when you're talked about, not only now, but when you're gone, that folk have good things to say about you and your lifestyle that they can witness in your favor. And we want that to be our testimony. May the Lord bless each of you tonight as we continue to strive to be all that God will have us to be. And by the grace of God, we will pick up at verse number uh, 12 on next week. The Lord allows us to live. Thank you to everyone. Services now, if I don't know if Bishop is on the line or not, uh, but if not, we'll turn services over to him. If not, then over to Sister Tamika. Love you.